Hey everybody, you know what time it is. It's time for another rollback. What is rollback? Rollback is the best podcast episodes from the past, the old audio only days, brought now directly to you right here on YouTube for the very first time. And today we're featuring the man behind the wildly successful 2010 documentary film, Fat, Sick and Nearly Dead. His name is Joe Cross. 100 pounds overweight, loaded up on prescription meds and suffering from a debilitating autoimmune disease. Joe Cross was a man on the brink. He was a guy at the end of his rope with doctors and conventional medicines just unable to really help him long-term. So what happens? Well, Joe ends up turning to the only option left, the body's ability to heal itself. And he does what anyone would do. He hits the road with a juicer and a film crew in tow, vowing only to drink fresh fruit and vegetable juice for 60 days. Across 3,000 miles, Joe has only one goal in mind, to get off all of his pills, his meds, and achieve a balanced lifestyle. And in this episode, number 47, from all the way back in September of 2013, Joe and I get into how he changed his life, how he helped to create a populist movement around juicing and healthy lifestyle. We talk about his passion for health and self-healing. And I really hope that you are inspired by his infectious energy, by his message, which is really to take your own wellness into your own hands and to the next level. So here we go. This is me and Joe Cross. You know, there's a lot of overlap in our stories. I think we're about the same age. I'm, a, I'm about to turn 47. I don't yeah, know I am 47. You're 47. I was born in 66. Okay. Right, me too. Yeah. So, Fire horse. <laughs> and we both had these kind of enough is enough epiphany moments at age 40, like me right before I turned 40, you at 40. I mean, we're, you know, our stories kind of diverge. You're, 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 certainly your health was in a little bit more of a dire circumstance than mine was at the time. But we both kind of kickstarted this new path on juicing. I, I, my juice cleanse was only seven days, and for me, that was enough to really reboot, to use your phrase, mm-hmm. you know, everything that I was doing. And it was, it was an incredibly powerful, <clears throat> you know, number of days where I felt like I could wipe the slate clean and start fresh. And so, as much of a physical change as it in, it entailed, it was also very much like a mental cleansing. Like I can, you know, I've done, I've endured this seven days. I feel sure. different now. Now I can go on a new trajectory. And one of the things that I found so striking in your film was as you were traveling across the country and you're meeting all these people, you would meet these people who are obviously, you know, in in poor physical health, and you say, "Hey, I'm doing in in a very friendly, non judgmental way." Say, "I'm hey, I'm doing this juicing." What you know? What, what would you, what would you think if I told you I've had nothing but juice for the last forty days or whatever? And you know, they'd look at you curiously and then just sort of dismiss it, you know, as impossible or not something they're interested in doing. And mm-hmm. and you'd be like, "Okay, nice to meet you." You never judge them. Cool. And, and 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 what I took from that is this gap between what needs to be done and where we're at in the sense that, you know, we have this obesity crisis and you lay out the statistics in the movie where, you know, this, the 60, 35, five percentages, Mm -hmm. 60% of the calories that, um, that we eat are coming from processed foods, uh, 40% from animal products, 30% 30 from animal products, 5% from grains and 5% from fruits and vegetables. Right. And, uh, and just to convince people to take that 5% and expand it is, is such a challenge. And yet, you know, people are suffering from diabetes and heart attack. I mean, even with Phil's brother who suffered a heart attack, he still, you could tell, was struggling with this idea of embarking on this journey that literally had transformed his brother's life. So, mm-hmm. so what we're dealing with here is really a psychology issue as much as anything else. Without and, question. And, and for me, I know just in my personal struggles – you know, people say, oh, people don't change. And, and I disagree with that. People do change. But people change when they're ready to change. And mm-hmm. people change, <laughs> usually people change when they're in pain or the pain becomes intolerable enough that it motivates them sufficiently to make a change. And, and for me, that's been the case. And, and so I guess the challenge is how do you catalyze that change without people having to hit the kind of bottom that you had to hit or that I had to hit or that Phil had to hit? 
Yeah, and it's a it's a, look, it's a it's a very good question, and I think that like what you're doing and what I'm doing and what there's so many others that are in our sort of uh, shoes are trying to do is to find out ways because I don't think there's one answer that fits all. I, I think you know, just take America for example. I think there's 316 million um, people in this country, right? 316 million. Now, that means there's 316 million different diets, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and different ways to go about being the best they can be. And so what I think is really important is not to be too preachy, not to be too like, um, I've got all the, the answers and if you sit and listen to me, you know, mm-hmm. I'll tell you what to do. And, 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 you know, I'm very conscious of just the way I even speak, like, <clears throat> saying, you know, I, I'd like to help people get healthy, you know, just using the words, I'm getting them. I'm actually not getting them. I, I like to use the word, I'm inspiring people or I'm helping or, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? It, it's a, They're subtle words, but they make a big difference in people, the way they listen. And, you know, quite often when I talk to to, to uh, crowds, when I do my uh, demos or, or, or talks, I ask the question, you know, hands up those out there that really love being told what to do, you know. Might be a thousand people in the audience, <laughs> and no one puts their hand up. Uh-huh. And if they do, then you know they're joking. But you know, no one really loves being told what to do. And then you ask the question: How many people love telling people what to do? And of course, all the hands go up. Right. So there epitomizes the big challenge in the world today: is that people love giving orders, not many people like taking them. And so I don't think that people in your shoes or mine that have, have are, are fortunate enough to have a platform where people are listening to what we have to say. I mean, they're interested enough in what we've done that they want to listen to what we're saying. So I think it's it's really uh, I- important to, to be humble. I know you are about that. I've only just met you, but I can tell already that you're humble about that. I'm, I'm very conscious of, of, of that. And I think that the, the more humble you can be, the more understanding, the more forgiving, the more that you don't have the answers, the more that you are honest and transparent and share – I think that resonates with people because, you know, I, I've got a saying which I really have, have – um, I've been using it for a long time. I don't even know where I learnt it from. I, I know someone told me, but I've forgotten, so I'd like to credit that person. But it's like the, the crowds are dumb, but people are really smart. Mm-hmm. And so when you're talking about things like this to people out there that are listening, every single one of them is really, really smart. Nobody needs you or I to come along and say, guess what? Fruits and vegetables, they've got all this powerful stuff. They're really good for you. I mean, they know that. Right. People know this stuff. It, it's not about the knowing, it's about the doing. Now, there are some things that they can learn and there's interesting stuff that can, I like to say, you know, at least, you know, they can remember what they've forgotten. So it's, <clears throat> it, it's to me, it's about storytelling. It's about uh, leading by example. It's about making it fun and interesting and you know, and, and it's not trying to give too much uh, of this this information over little bits, little nuggets that you can do little things that can make a big difference. Mm-hmm. And don't try and do everything all in one day, mm-hmm. you know, because it's a, it's 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 like you got to you got to you got to. I mean, people talk to me about rebooting a lot. I mean. And, and what I've found and, and what we're going to talk about hopefully in movie number two or three, and this is like an example, we're, we're just trying to work out where it fits in, but, you know, I use the analogy of, of going to a swimming pool and people getting wet. You know how like you, you go to a pool and people who are getting out of the pool, they're all wet. Everyone's wet. You don't actually know how they got wet. Did they dive in or did they walk in? Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, they got wet. I, I like to think about analogy of healthy to being wet. So people can get healthy did they dive in or did they walk in to their challenge or their their, their mm-hmm. journey of getting healthy? So like a reboot is really a dive in. It's like, you know, right, I'm taking my 5% of plants to 100% for like mm-hmm. you did seven days. I did, I, did, I did 60 plus 90. I did like the whole mm-hmm. nine yards. Um, some people, that's not going to work for them. Right. Some people just can't go cold turkey or bang to that. Some people, that's what they want. So they're the dive in mm-hmm. people. Others like to walk in and go slowly. So I think it's important to be aware that you've got all these different uh, ways that people can achieve this. And, and so 
you know, it's a, it's a good question you ask, but I feel that if we if we can come at it from these angles, that we can we can have the most impact. Right. I mean, I think that one of the things that you do, and that I always try to bear in mind in the way that I speak to people and kind of deliver the message is. I'm not, I'm not telling people what to do. I'm not even trying to give advice. I'm just sharing my experience. Yeah. This is what I did. This is what happened to me. And you can draw your own inferences. And I have my opinions around that, but it's not my place to impose them upon you. Yeah. And I think you did, you were, you, you handled that very deftly in the movie by just saying, Hey, this is what I'm doing. Like, come on this journey with me or not. It's cool. Yeah. Like I'm just cruising across the country. You know what I mean? Like exactly. want a juice out of my car, you know? Well, because you have that and, attitude is why your, your podcast are so successful. That's because, I mean, if you and I get on on uh, the airwaves, start screaming out. Uh-huh. I mean, hey, who's well, and I don't have. I have people on that have a completely different dietary, you know, approach than I do. I mean, I it's just like let's be adults and have a conversation. We can yeah. we can get along. Like exactly. it's just a food choice. You exactly. Know what I mean? so, exactly. Um, We've all got to put energy in our body, Richard. Yeah. I, mean, I look at it this way. You know, we've all got to. We are consumers of energy. That's what we are, humans. We're massive consumers of energy, and we need energy to live. If we don't get energy into our body, it's very simple, we will die. We are, we are driven to be alive. That's what we want to do. Our, our three trillion cells, their whole mission is to stay alive. And so they need energy at that cellular level to convert, to, to stay alive. And we only, when you really think about it, you know, we've got air, we've got water, we've got food. They're our primary three own main energy sources. And, mm-hmm. you know, you can talk about love and intimacy and you can, and I believe in that, but I'm talking about physical things that go into your body. And when you then look at the air and the water and, and food and, you know, if you and I can't do much about our water and air, I mean, you know, that's a big picture problem, right? That, that, right. that, that that's, that's macro stuff. But the food is the real micro one that we can actually have some kind of a say in. We can actually – choose what sort of food energy we decide to to feed our body. And I like to think about it very simply because I think people respond, I know I do, to simple things. I mean, so much confusion out there and I think breaking it down to very simple um, uh, philosophy or, or logic is, is helpful. And you've got three types of food you can eat. You can eat plants, you can eat animal, you can eat processed food. And there, that's it. They're, they're the three. Mm-hmm. And – each one of those three groups, of course, that you've got protein, carbohydrate, you've got sugars, you've got fats, you've got all that. But you know what? Let's, let's, let's leave that aside for the moment. Let's just look at the three categories, you know, plants, animal, processed. And I like to think that, you know, they're the three um, to choose from. And I like to put the processed and the animal in what I call the fun part of town. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I like to put the plants in the essential part of town. Now, I'm sure for someone like you, the plants are the fun mm-hmm. part of town. But let's just <laughs> let's just let's just talk um, about the no, masses. We're, we're gonna fight now. No, 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 no. The <laughs> masses of people that are yeah. out there. I, I okay? understand what you're saying yeah. completely. So, so we all know what happens when you spend too much time in the fun part of town. You know what? It ain't fun anymore. Fun, fun is defined by only doing it every now and then. Otherwise, it's not fun. You do something mm-hmm. all the time. It's not fun. So. We have gone down this path where, as, as we talked about those numbers earlier, where, you know, it's actually 93%. I've learned a bit since the first movie. It's 93% of our energy on average for the average American, Australian person in Great Britain, you know, Western world, 93% of our energy is coming from what I'm calling the fun part of town. Mm-hmm. 7% is coming from the essential part of town. And so when you – when you look at that, you cannot ignore the biological laws of cause and effect, as Dr. Joel Furman says in my film. You cannot, you can't ignore that, and you're going to have this this epidemic of disease and and unhappiness. And so, I think laying that out and understanding that, just on, on a base level, for anybody to understand those those three you know categories, and then it's up to you and and the per- people out there, I believe to decide well, what what number do you want your plant intake to be? Do you want it to be from seven if you're average? Do you want to go to 10? Do you want to go to 15? Do you want to go to 40? Do you want to go to 100? It's up to you. Right. Well, I think there's a, a couple things. I mean, when you talk about spending too much 
time in the fun part of town, that begs the question of sort of moderation versus extreme behavior. And some would say that for you to go on this juice cleanse, this juice fast for 60 days plus the 90 that came after it, or for me to be 100% plant-based and go to these crazy endurance races, those are extreme behaviors. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we, well, just, they'd be right. we just, yeah, we just met, but I think we're on the, we are, we share a similar wavelength where sure. I'm attracted to that kind of challenge or, and, and I, I almost need that. Like I needed to do the juice fast to wipe the table clean and start fresh. Mm -hmm. And I need to challenge myself. I need to jump in with both feet. I need to do something extreme in order to alter my status quo and my behavior patterns. Mm -hmm. And and when I jump in and do something like that that's outside of my comfort zone or scares me, that that energizes me. And also there's a momentum that develops behind that. And mm -hmm. I think a big part of this is momentum. And I think a big part of your message in this whole reboot is about generating momentum. Because even if you do one day of juice fasting and then you got through it, then maybe you'll do a second one or you'll be more energized or enthusiastic or motivated to continue. But there are people who say, well, I'm not ready to dive in. You know, I just want to dip my toe in and, and start to get wet that way. I don't necessarily relate to those people, but I agree with you that they exist and, mm -hmm. and that, you know, there needs to be a path for them as well. Um, I think it's harder to create momentum behind what they're trying to do if they're just, they're sort of one foot in and one foot out. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with that. And I find that those are the people who most often come to me and say, well, what's wrong with moderation? What's wrong with moderation? And, and I'm interested in kind of how you respond to that. I'm sure you get that question all the time. I mean, for me, I say, well, what are we talking about here? Because I think we, we've skewed what moderation really is. Like, tell yeah. me uh, what you're eating and we'll see if it's truly right. moderate that's or right. not. That's right, know? exactly. And I'm willing to bet, you know, looking at you, unhealthy person, that what you're doing probably isn't moderation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand exactly and relate to it. So, you know, I think, first of all, I think, and I know that you feel this way because you've, you've sort of hinted it already in our chat, that just because you do something extreme doesn't make you better or worse. It just makes Absolutely. you different. And that's a key, right? Just to understand our differences amongst ourselves is important because I think what can sort of tend to happen is people feel that because someone does something to an extreme – that they're trying to be better than other people or they're trying to prove a point or it's about ego mm -hmm. as opposed to being about spirit. So let's assume that all everything we're talking about is coming from the, the angle of spirit. And if that's the case, then, you know, just today, take America today, there is going to be someone that's the oldest person in America today and there's going to be someone who's just born. And then there's going to be a whole bunch of ages and we're going to have this beautiful – Gasconian bell curve that I used to spend so much time on when I was back in the financial markets in my previous life. And the, the, the normalized distribution of, of any sample set of data um, shows that there are things on the extreme, the oldest person, the youngest person. You can do it with weight. You can do it with height. You can do it with anything. And you can also do it with your attitude to life. And so you're going to get this medium or, or standard deviation one, which is the most of what, what's average or what's balanced or what's, what's the middle. Now, when it comes to what we're eating and that lifestyle, I couldn't agree with you more that it is so skewed, so far from really if you, if, if you were to get a lot of great minds of, um, from all walks of life, be it from, from the medical world, be it from the scientific world, be it from spiritual world, and you had a sort of a, a consensus of what is the best thing for people to eat. There's no mm -hmm. question that what we're eating on average is so far skewed to an extreme that that having 93% of our energy coming from from plant and uh, and process, it's really second, third, and fourth hand energy. I mean, we're not getting the energy directly right. from where it's produced. So low on the food chain. Yeah, yeah, it, very much so. So I think that that. When I get asked these questions about, Joe, that's pretty extreme doing 60 days of juice and then 90 days of just eating fruit, vegetables, nuts, beans, and seeds and some whole grains, I go, yeah, it was. But the reason why I, I, I chose to do that was because I had this awareness and, and, and aha moment that I was actually extreme the other way. So, see, where my life was, was actually 
I was maintaining this. I was like redlining this extremity the opposite direction. My lifestyle choices, you know, my my diet, my smoking, my alcohol intake, my, my drink intake, be it, you know, sodas and milkshakes and so on, uh, my lack of exercise, my stress levels, my lack of sleep, um, my anger, all of those things. I mean, you know, you mm-hmm. look at all of the lifestyle choices. I mean, I'm redlining the lot. I'm, I'm getting a big fat F in all of them if I have to score myself. <laughs> so no wonder – I'm 300 and, you know, 10, 320 pounds. No wonder I'm on medication night and day for eight years. No wonder I'm, I'm uh, you know, one foot in the grave. No wonder. I mean, I'm a walking time bomb. So, and I'm only 40. I, mean, I was actually 32 to 40 for that period. Um, so I, I look at that as an extreme and then I, I needed to go the other way that extreme to find the balance, right? And I'm not the saying I found it now. I mean, I'm still trying, but you know, you know. The other way I look at it, Rich, is I sort of go, you know, go down to. Um, I think we can learn a lot from kids. I think kids can really teach us a lot. So, I go down to any playground anywhere in the world, and we call them a seesaw in Australia. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like yeah, a seesaw. Yeah. Is that That's what I said? The fulcrum of the balance of the seesaw yeah. tipping from one end to yeah. You to know the, the seesaw. One, okay, right, so yeah. hopefully everyone understands the seesaw around America because mm-hmm. right? sometimes we we have different words. But, <laughs> but the seesaw. I challenge you to look at any two kids that get on a seesaw. You know what kids love to do? They love to get to that balancing point where both kids' feet are off the ground. But I've never seen kids that can go there straight away. They've got to go high, low, high, low, do, 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 slowly, slowly, slowly to get to balance. And I think that's kind of like with us as well. We've got to go and explore these extremes to see and experience and to feel and to know and then we have our own boundaries set, our own guidelines set, so that we can then go, you know what? That kind of extreme of just drinking juice, while that was really cool, I don't think that that's something I should do the rest of my life. <laughs> now, logically, that doesn't make sense, and that's probably not healthy because we know it isn't if you just juice only. So likewise, living on, you know, when I used to go to McDonald's, I would order a, a Big Mac, a quarter pound of cheese, a cheeseburger, a, a large – Fries, a chocolate shake, I love a it. chocolate sundae, and yeah. get this, a Diet Coke. And don't what ask about me the apple pie? Diet. Did you say the apple no, pie? The no, the chocolate sundae. Okay. No, no, no. The apple right. pie didn't have enough sugar in it for me. So it was like- No double cheeseburgers? No, they, we didn't have them back in those oh, you days. Didn't? No. Okay. We, we were pretty like, you know, vanilla menu <laughs> down in Australia. So anyway, so, you know, that's a $16 meal. Right. Do you know, let me, let me just uh, interrupt you for one second. Do you, in, uh, in Australia, do you know Andrew G. Osher yeah. Gunsberg? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So he's a friend of mine. I had him on the podcast and he calls it the window diet. He said, if they roll down the window <laughs> and they hand it to you, you eat it. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Well, of course, I'd never get out of the car. Why get out of a car when they can, you no, know, you can drive not. up and, yeah. you know, yeah. why, why expend that energy? Right. I mean, come on. So, so I think that when you go, when you, when you explore both extremes, and and so I think I think the answer is is that for for what we're trying to get the long answer to your question, which is that you know extremes. Um, the reason why I think a reboot works for so many people is it's doing two things. It's it's taking out a lot of the 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 animal and the processed. So it's giving our our system a break from having to deal with that type of energy, number one. And then the flip side is because we're, re- we're supercharging with the, uh, you know, I call it freebasing Mother Nature, because we're actually putting this uh, high, rich energy in, your body's never, it's never had that experience of being flooded with so much phytonutrients and, and you know, and liquid sunshine. It's, it's, never, it's never had that before. So you get this, this, this two- this, this flip side going on, which is working to really take you to another level. And I think what it does, it resets the taste buds. It takes you to this high, like from the from the valley to the top of the mountain. And if anyone who's been in a valley knows, you don't get much of a view. But when you're on top of a mountain, boy, the view can be just spectacular. Mm-hmm. And that's addictive. That is, that's, that's a real um, uh, natural high. And so that in itself, I think all of that, what I just talked about, creates this 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 like falling back in love with fruits and vegetables and you have this 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 romantic uh, feeling that wow this stuff's really good you know and it's almost like we've been cheating on like it's like we've been cheating on a partner 
for like the last 80 years. I mean, for, for thousands of years, we were pretty happy with our plants. You know, we, mm-hmm. we, we sort of with them and we turned our back on them. And so now we're sort of paying the penalty. So we've got to try and get the relationship back back in uh, full swing. Right. And I, I think that, you know, sometimes when somebody says, well, that's extreme, my response is, well, yeah, so what? I mean, it requires a re- an extreme response and, and what's wrong with that? You know, I think that a little extreme behavior once in a while is okay in order to shake things up. I mean, in order to get something good, you have to, you know, get out of your comfort zone and work hard. And one of the things that I thought was great about your movie is it didn't try to skirt around that. It, it didn't try to say, this is super easy. It's like, yeah, actually, this is going to be painful for a while. You're mm. going to have to get out of your comfort zone. It's not going to feel good. But you, when you weather it through, like all good things in life that you know you can place value on, it will be worth it and it will transform your life. And there is, you know, our society is now, we're, we're rigged to try to avoid anything uncomfortable. Everything about our culture is about being comfortable, mm-hmm. making things easy and immediate. And we've lost touch with the value of, of uh, you know, hard work and getting out of your comfort zone and trying something new and pushing yourself. And, and uh, you know, I think that it's worth exploring. And if you want to call that extreme, you know, I don't, I, I don't know what to say to that. I mean, yeah. I think that it's, it's uh, like I said, you know, I would question what the, what's, what's wrong with a little extreme behavior once in a while. And, you know. I, I, I think one of the most underused words and, um, and things is perspective. I think we we tend to have don't use perspective enough. You know, not only the word, but also the actual action of it. So if I sort of put things and this, I, I use perspective a lot as a very powerful tool. You know, I, I use it to go like time travel. I, I go forward twenty years in time in in, in a perspective. I go, what's my life going to be like at sixty seven? Because I'm forty seven today, and I really think about. At 67, what am I going to be able to do? Where am I going to be able to go? What are my knees going to be like? What are my shoulders going to be like? Um, how, how many pounds am I going to be? Am I going to be on medication? Am I going to have all my hair? You know, I think about these things, and maybe I'm crazy, but I actually use it. I don't think about it all the time, but every now and then I'll think about that. And I sort of pretend I'm in the future kind of thing, and I'll – go, you know what, I really want to go sailing today. I want to go for a hike or I want to go and ride my bike along the beach when I'm 67. I want to be doing that. And so I go, I know that the the choices I'm going to make today, now I flash back in time to real time and I go, I know the choices I'm going to make today are going to set up me being able to do that in the future. So I, I, I use perspective a lot in that way. I also use it to cover off the question that you're talking now about, about extreme, extreme. And I look at, say, from when I was 20 to 40, like those 20 years of my life, and I look at what, you know, I did 20 years where I basically smashed my body effectively. You know, I, I would say I did the crime, so to speak, right? And I paid the penalty in terms of, of, of being sick and being overweight and being uh, – I was a pretty happy guy. I'm not, I don't want to paint the picture that I was depressed because I'm a generally a happy mm. person. But I you know, wasn't happy about being on medication and I wasn't happy about you know, having to size 44 jeans or not being able to go in and buy clothes. It wasn't good, you know. But you know, and I looked at that and I thought, okay, you know, really what is uh, – two years is what I decided it would take to decide – whether I was going to be able to get my life back on track. I mean, I'd done 20 years of, of, of the crime. I thought two years in sort of prison, so to speak, to use the analogy, mm-hmm. like to be sentenced to two years of hard labor, which is plants only, um, to, see if I could, <laughs> to see if I could get How well. terrible, Joe. Well, yeah, but, but you've got to remember, coming from the position where I was, that did sound terrible. And if, if we talk to average Americans out there today, you said you're going to eat plants for the next two years – from their diet, they would think that. I know, no, I know. I know. And I thought that. Yeah. I really did. I really did. Well, this think- goes back to the issue of perspective, right? Correct. And and to sort of piggyback on what you're saying, you know, take a step back and have a larger, sort of broader perspective on the way that we're leading our lives or what's normal now. And, you know, when you look at men in their 40s and their 50s, and it's it's all about erectile dysfunction and Viagra and how many medications you're on and the stent that you're having put in or the heart attack you just had or the 
bypass surgery you had and the obesity and the diabetes and all this sort of thing, that's normal. That doesn't, nobody blinks an eye when yeah. guys our age talk about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's completely radical if you say, I'm gonna wake up in the morning and instead of having bacon and eggs or pancakes for breakfast, I'm gonna have a green juice. Yep. You're like a pariah. Yeah. So that's a weird perspective shift, I think, where there's a, so much, a lot of work that needs to be done, very of much. course. I mean, you ask any, any person from around the world who comes to America and spends a week on vacation, you know what one of the – and, and if they're in a hotel, okay, they've got to be in a hotel. You know what one of the big things they're going to tell you that they just cannot believe about America is how much advertising on television there is for pharmaceutical drugs. Mm -hmm. See, we don't have that in other parts of the world. But if you're in America, that's normal. Right. But that's so unnormal. That's so not normal. All and, of these ads. And, with, and all the warnings and about the warnings. you're going to have suicidal well, ideations I mean, and, you know, possible I mean, heart failure. And I mean, can you imagine, <laughs> you imagine us advertising green juice? And, of course, the, the real bad side effects are you're going to feel great. You're going to, like, lose a few pounds. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's I, I don't know. But, but I think, yeah, perspective is, is a really powerful tool. So 20 years, I smash myself. I say to myself, I'm going to do two years in like, you know, plant world and that's my prison, so to speak. I end up saying I'm going to do solitary confinement for the first two months, which was 60 days of juice. Mm -hmm. And then it, I only, I was, I was let out on good behavior after 90 more days. So in five months, I got my body back. I didn't even need to do the two well, years. Well, you had Stockholm syndrome because you fell in love with your captor. That's right. right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's the other thing too, that, that is a big part of my story. I mean, like yourself, I smashed my body forever, drugs, alcohol, window diet. I mean, you know, McDonald's, I mean, I, I'm right with you with all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and the amazing thing that I think, you know, you the point is made in your movie, but also I think it needs to be hammered home even more in a more hardcore way is just how unbelievably resilient the human body is when you begin to treat it right mm -hmm. in a very, very short period of time, 20 years of abuse, yep. and you're still alive, you know, and then within a matter of days, weeks, but really in a matter of days. I mean, in, a, in one week of doing a juice fast, you can completely change how you feel and reset your trajectory after 20 years of abuse. The body responds when you start treating it right. It's, it's amazing. It you know? And so for people that are out there that are struggling or they think they can't do it or uh, it's not for them, you know, I urge all of you to try something like this, like just a week, it's a week out of your life. Yeah. You know, we'll refund you your misery. You can go back to eating McDonald's. You know what I mean? But like to just, you owe it to yourself to try something new and different and to pay attention to how your body responds to how you treat it. Yeah. No, I, I, I couldn't say it better myself. It's, you know, I mean, I saw the, the, the most, the sort of the most emotional moment in your movie for me that gave me like chills when I saw it is when you're kind of um, sort of experiencing the success of this journey for yourself and you're enjoying that run on the beach on Bondi. And then you cut to Phil and he's running in the snow. And I was like, he's running. Yeah, you know, like incredible. What a miracle it is for that guy to be doing that. Like, look, I have goosebumps for yeah, no, I, just I, remembering I it. It's I amazing too. that a guy like that could experience such a dramatic change, but it all started because he, you know, in recovery, they say sobriety isn't for people who need it, it's for people that want it. Mm. And, you know, you, you encounter that guy in the truck stop, you had a conversation with him, like you had with a lot of people on your cross country journey. 350. But somebody, something just stuck with him. And one day he picked up the phone, he was ready. You know, you have to be ready. Sure. You, you have to be, have you, that moment you for gotta yourself. Be you got to be open. And, you know, I'm sure you get this, Rich, but I get so many husbands and wives or partners saying, you know, my partner, the person I love the most, just isn't making the change. What can I do to, to, to get them? You know, it's like you, know, you can lead the horse to water, you can't make a drink. And my answer, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I think, you know, you just got to be patient, you know, and, and by pushing that person, you're actually making it worse. By actually pushing them, you're actually driving them further away. I couldn't agree with you more. What, what I say to them is, listen, okay, let's just say it's a, it's a wife of a husband and they're trying to get their husband to do it. I say, look, you know what you can do? If you're the nutritional gatekeeper of the house, like you're the one who goes and gets all the, the food, start making healthier food. If he doesn't eat it, 
that's fine. Like he's not going to eat it. Like mm-hmm. he, he can do whatever, but just keep at it and, and lead by example. But don't don't push it. Like don't you know? It's like don't tell people what to do. We go back to that, you know. But I know it's hard. I know it's really tough, and I, I, I it's sometimes it's easy just to say it. But but really, it's um you know people have to realize they're making it worse by pushing people sometimes. If you're not ready, yeah, not ready. Right. Absolutely. Um, I experienced that firsthand. Actually, my wife, who, is, who was the nutritional gatekeeper in our house, she wrote a post on Mind Body Green about our experience with this. And it was, a, it was a really interesting thing that happened, which was she was always much healthier than me. And for a long time, she's like, try this. Why don't you do this? Why aren't you eating like this? Like, you know, she was always trying to get me on a better path than I was on. And the more she did that, the more I resisted. Sure. And I was like, I don't want any of that. And then one day, like, Honestly, like in a, on a very kind of deep spiritual level, she just made peace with it and she just let it go. And she's like, I love him the way he is. He's got his own path and it's none of my business. I'm going to, she still would make the healthy meals and she would lead by example and do all those things that you said, but she really let it go. And I think some, when that happened, like she didn't announce it to me, she didn't say anything to me, yeah. but I knew it, I could sense it. And then suddenly there was no push on me yeah. and, and that made me go, Oh wait, like exactly. maybe I should change because like I have to do it for my like she's not pushing me to do it. Like yeah. this is on me now. Yeah. yeah. And it made me really look at myself and go, you know, I maybe you know, I don't like the way I feel and I would like to feel better the way she's doing and maybe there is something to this, but I had to come to that on, on in my own way. 100%. You know? no, I couldn't agree more. You've got to you've got to arrive at that position yourself. If, if anyone who's pushed there, it's just not going to happen. It's it's such a it's such a personal thing that I feel that it's almost like you want to own it yourself and you've got to own it because these changes, I mean, you know, I'm sure you have too, Rich, but one of the things that we're very lucky about in our positions is we get to speak to a lot of smart people, a lot of people that know a lot more than you and I put mm-hmm. together, right? And I spoke to a guy called Professor Brian Wansink who wrote that book, uh, Careless and Mindless Eating. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> he and his researchers – yeah, you know, they've been studying food behavior for 25 years. So you just imagine that. That's been your life. Your life's work is food behavior. Not necessarily healthy food, just how people behave around food. And what, what I learned from, uh, from him in my, in my three or four hours is just, do you, you know how many decisions we make about food every day, just the average person? Over 200. Mm. Now, if you've got over 200 choices and decisions on food every day, and you're just going to rely on self-discipline, good luck with that. Mm-hmm. Good luck with that. Good luck with the time that you're stressed or you're in a hurry or someone's shouting at you or you've got a, like, you know, you're tired, you didn't sleep very well. Good luck at trying to choose the, the cucumber over the chocolate bar then. You know? Well, then what is the solution then? Well, I think, I think being aware – Aware of that is really is really important. Mindfulness. But, 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 but here's but the, I'm, I'm saying that in connection to it coming from within. So if you in yourself have arrived at that point rather than using the, the, the example you said with your wife, is if your wife's trying to push you. Well, the minute then, she's looking the other direction, I'm agreeing. That's my point. <laughs> yeah. Because you've got 200 choices, therefore it's not going to. It has to come from within because when it's coming from within, then those 200 choices that you make – there's a much more of a of an internal assistance that's helping you guide that way. So when you say what's the solution, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what I really think and, and what I believe is that when you do a reboot and you feel so amazing and you're loving the view and you're putting the fuel in that makes you feel fabulous, those 200 choices are a lot easier to make. Yeah, and I would add to that that – you know, if you're making unhealthy food choices or you feel like you have these food addictions or you're powerless and that elevator is going down, you don't have to hit some crazy bottom like I did or like Joe did where you have a big reckoning moment where your doctor tells you you're going to die. I mean, you can get off that elevator at any moment. You cool. can make that decision. And what's great about doing one of these juice fasts or the reboot or whatever version of it that you want to do is that it involves putting a lot of energy into a shift, right? And like we were talking about before, that number of days or the amount of energy or just the process of going to the store and buying these foods and preparing to do this number of days where you're going to do this kind of radical, seemingly radical thing, 
creates that momentum for you to then set in motion a new way of doing things. And I think it's really powerful. Yeah, and, I, and I'd also add to that that a lot of people come to me and say, you know, I don't think I need to do it, but I think my diet's pretty good. And I go, well, that's fantastic. I mean, that's awesome. But then I just say, but you know what? What's really cool, and I've had a lot of people do this, so you might want to try, is that one of the great ways to find out just how good your diet is is to try a reboot Mm -hmm. because if you can do a reboot and really cruise through it without any pain or any suffering or any withdrawals, (laughs) then the chances are that what you are doing is that. Right. But you know what? This is a great way to challenge yourself to find out if what you are doing is – it's like a calibrator because – if you, you get if, so used to feeling lousy, you don't know that you're you don't you don't know that you feel lousy. Yeah, well, even if people think they're on a great diet, this is my my point is mm-hmm. is that I, I meet a lot of like really fit looking, healthy looking people that say, you know, my diet's perfect. Or they don't say they don't use the word perfect. They say, My diet's my diet's really good. I go, Well, then you probably don't need to do a reboot. But I'll tell you what you could do just for a bit of like science experiment on yourself <coughs> is try it. And if you're sort of don't experience any withdrawals or any pain, then the odds are that you are on a really good diet. <laughs> but if you experience withdrawals, if you're incredibly tired, if you're agitated, if you're angry, then you probably didn't realise it, but there was probably something in the way you were living that was too much. Because I, I, I know from now the hundreds of thousands of people that have done this is that the more pain you go through in those first three or four days of of, of juicing or switching to plants, if you go th- if you go through massive pain, that means that you were doing something in your diet that was really giving you a lot of grief. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's the caffeine, whether it's the sugar, whether it's the salt, whether it's the fat. But you know, you, you just don't you, you don't suffer withdrawals on juicing if your diet is is in great shape to start with. You don't. Right. I mean, when I did it, I was I couldn't move. I was on the couch for a good two and a half, maybe three days. Like I literally felt like I was back in rehab, like yeah. detoxing off opiates or something like yeah, that. Yeah, no, no. It it's horrific. I, I, believe you me, I, I, I mean, <laughs> I stupidly didn't even let the cameras in. I was feeling that bad. I mean, yeah. here am I, mate, because I never made a movie before. I mean, right. You know. I'm like, you guys are staying out there. I'm, oh, I'm that's like, the, that's the good stuff. I, I know, but I didn't you know? know that. You see, I never made a movie before, right? Like, you know, like honestly, I uh, and when I got to the last day, you know, you start to feel better with each progressive day until you just feel amazing. And I get to the last day, and I tell my wife, like, I'm just, you know, like I hadn't seen your movie. Your movie hadn't come out yet. And I'm like, I want to keep going. Like I, you know, like this, there's no reason to stop. Like literally like a good alcoholic. I'm just like, this is, I don't need food anymore. Yeah. I'm just going to, cause I feel <laughs> so good. Yeah, we get a lot of so that. So I understand the whole, like, I'm going to go for 30. I'm going to go for 60. Like I was, if had I seen your movie before doing it, I probably would have gone much longer. I wanted to, yeah. you know? Well, you know, on day 60, um, I wasn't actually too far from where we are now. We're in LA and I was in San Diego, when I went up in the air, in the, in the balloon to to uh, break my sixty days, uh, and I'm watching that, thinking, why? Well, just keep. Why don't you keep going? Oh, look, I, I thought I, maybe you weren't going to take a bite and say I'm going to do another thirty. You, 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 you know what? You know, if I had if I had the budget, I probably would have. But like having a film crew and having all of that done, it was kind of like the logistics. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've learned a lot now. I actually knowing now, I probably could have because I could have just said, "Go and take a break, guys, and we'll just catch you in." But I didn't think that. I was filming every day. I mean, right. I, I've learned a lot about making movies since then, let me tell you. So so I was feeling so good. I really was thinking about doing 100 days. Like there was, But then I started doing the finances of it's another 40 days of the crew and I'm, I'm going to mm-hmm. go broke. Did you so, self-finance the movie or how did it, how did it work? Yeah, I, in the beginning, I, um, I, the, the whole idea was to, 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 um, uh, to do it myself. But I started telling some mates of mine in Australia who were, who are just uh, good buddies in the finance world and stockbroking and, and futures world where I came from and some others from the investment banking world. And uh, they all said, oh, this is great. You know, we'll, we'll have a piece mm-hmm. of this. So a bunch of uh, mates uh, also put some money in and they, I think in the end I was like 75% and they were like 25% right. of the movie. And did you have any idea at the time that it would become the phenomenon that it has become? It depends what you mean by at the time, because it took, well, it I would, took from I think 2006 that, to 2011 right. before it was released. So when Phil rang me up, okay, see how long the, how long in real time was it from when you met Phil to when he called you? Uh, I met Phil in um, November of 2007, 
and he called me in May of 2008. Uh-huh. So, and, and I was, and, I, and the film, the first film I made, which no one will ever see, uh, was, <laughs> was actually um, my journey across America and six people that did a 10-day uh, reboot. Mm-hmm. And that's where Siong, who um, the, the, the one lady that's in the movie that does right. her, her juicing with her coffee and her husband out in, uh, in Iowa, believe it or not, and there's the Iowa connection again. So um, and, and we were on time, on budget with the movie to be my journey arc, the beginning to the end, and then these six people who were juicing while I was doing mine. So, so my 60 days was broken into six 10 days with other people doing it. So mm-hmm. for the whole journey, I was talking to these six average Americans. So that was the first movie. But then when Phil called up, I said to the producer, Stacey Hoffman, I said, Stacey, we've got to get over and film this guy. She said to me, Joe, you are insane. We're, we've got a movie that's nearly, nearly finished and you want to break out the crew again and – Shoot stuff. I mean, yeah, this is unheard of. Movie, this, this is unheard of. Yeah. But we didn't know it was right, a movie. Right, you got to remember. You don't know. He could flake after a day. Correct. Or, yeah. yeah. So you got to remember. You got to go back to all we've got is a voicemail. Mm-hmm. All we've got is a voicemail of a guy saying, "I need help." Okay. So it was like, "What do you do here?" And I thought, I'm instant, immediately, I've got to go over and do it. I mean, I, it, I, there was no doubt in my mind that I mm-hmm. had to shoot it. The question was, how would it fit into the movie? And so I thought that this could be in the credits. So when the credits are running, there could be this three-minute, four-minute vignette of Phil, mm-hmm. right? That was kind of the thinking. So that's how I convinced her to agree for me to spend my own money <laughs> to, to, make, to, to get the crew out again, right? So then we went, we went to Sheldon, Iowa. In, um, in, in, it took about a month to get that planned. So it was Mother's Day in May, and then we didn't get there till – you know, just around 4th of July, it was just before. It was like late June. Right. It took about four weeks, five weeks to plan, organise, get everything set, crew, me back to the US and work out what we were going to do, get doctors organised to, to monitor him. So I, when we got there, I thought 10 days will, will be enough for Phil. He'll do 10 days and that's all we planned on. Right, because you were, yeah, you're there and then you're kind of like, all right, I got to go. And yeah, you, well, were, you were- well, well, I only, I, I made a conscious decision that, it's no good having Joe fly in and be this, Baby you know, trainer. Mm-hmm. Baby, you know, no, no. Otherwise, that's like, that's like, um, that's not real. I mean, I, I can't do that for everybody, you know. But mm-hmm. coming in and spending the day before, getting him, you know, meeting him again, seeing where he lives, um, getting the doctor to look and see whether this is possible, going to a supermarket, cranking him out, showing him the first juice, this is what you do, this is how it works, and then saying, right, I'm going to leave you with a sound guy, a, a, a camera guy, and a producer. There's going to be three people. They're going to stay here for the next 10 days. And you want to quit, you quit. You want to do anything? You know, these guys are not telling you what to do. All they are is to capture your thoughts and what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Right? No one's telling you what to do here, Phil. And so I said, you know, I'll come back in, um, in 10 days or I'll meet you or we'll talk then. I didn't actually plan to actually come back. Because it was like, you know, what we'll just talk on the phone. Mm-hmm. But then he got to day 10 and he said, I want to keep going. And I'm like, really? $3,500 a day for my camera <laughs> crew out there and accommodation by the lake. How long I do you look like want- a really nice, like, lake accommodations there. It's yeah, like, like a like, nice ha- vacation. <clears throat> How long do you want to go for? <laughs> so, so it was. You call con- up your buddies in finance. Yeah, well, well, this is where it got to, you know, now the economic crisis yeah. is happening too now in 2008. <laughs> And so I'm like, I'm like, okay, well, we'll keep them going, you know, like we'll keep the cameras going and let's see where this goes. But, and, and then, of course, the, we didn't know he was going to keep going and we didn't know the doctor would let him. We didn't know the results. I mean, we had no idea, mm-hmm. you know. And so it went another 60 days and he wanted to keep going. And I said, mate, you're you really sending me broke. We have to stop. And so that was it. So he went 61. Mm-hmm. And then he kept going afterwards so we couldn't finish the film because, mm-hmm. like, he wanted to get into that T-shirt. And it took another nine months, and he mm. was there running in that final right, scene. In the so, final shot. So it's like now we've got a we've got we've got like this whole new film versus the other film, and so we had to then start again. Right. So all the work on the first film was like new editors, new team come in. So all that money is sunk, and so now the budget is really blowing out. So now enter enter my my uh, my. 
bank managers having a coronary heart attack. And so, <laughs> so you know, it was it was it was a it was a very interesting time um, because. And you asked me when did I know? I felt that my journey was equivalent to the Forrest Gump running across America and people just coming along and following. And Phil was the first person to follow. He was really the first person mm. who said, "You know what? I liked what that guy did, and I saw what he did. I want to try that." And so it was kind of like the when Harry met Sally moment, you know, I'll have what she's having. And that to me was when I knew at that point, I thought, wow, Phil calling up and a bloke, I mean, no one really cares about a rich white guy from Australia, you know, I mean, who cares about Joe? But a Phil, a bloke who's 430 pounds, who's effectively living in the back of his truck that, you know, needs the TV on at night when he was sleeping in those first four or five days by the lake because he could not not sleep without noise because he's used to the trucks on the highway and noise. Um, you know, that's that's To that's a guy who's, at the, who's, at the, who's doing a community night at the natural foods market yeah, like, and everyone's like, showing up and he's explaining to them what kale 30 is. 30 days later. Yeah. I mean, it's mm. incredible. So, so I knew then that we had something. Um, I didn't think it was going to be as big as it is because you just don't. I, I, but I know. also get the sense that just from getting an idea of the way your mind works and, and watching the movie and, and reading up a little bit on you. I mean, I get the sense that when you made the movie, it wasn't just, Hey, I'm going to make a movie and go back to my life in finance that there was a, there was a long-term plan here. Like uh, to only, start this movement. Only seven months later though. Remember the, mm-hmm. honestly, if, if Phil hadn't made the phone call, I reckon I would have gone, just got that movie out because I wouldn't have put the effort in. I wouldn't have, and it would have come out in 2000 and, um, and it would have come out at the end of 2008 and that wouldn't have been a Netflix. You know what I mean? No, so- it would have been just a, it would have been an interesting movie, but it would not have captured the, I mean, the emotional connection that you develop with Phil and that story and the relationship between the two of you guys is what really sure. elevates the whole sure. thing. So I think that there was a lot of, um, uh, you know, I, I, you can use the word luck, and I believe in luck. I mean, I have you know, rule number two in my life is lady luck follows a person of action. So you've got to be doing the things to bring it on. But I think that there was a there was like a an alignment of the planet, so to speak, where a lot of sequences and a lot of events have led to this story or or of sharing getting out there. So you know, very fortunate with social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, these things to be in their prime when the movie broke. Very fortunate to have Hulu, Netflix, Amazon, Apple, iTunes, all of these things really firing at the time when the content came out. So, you know, that that's – you can't underestimate the distribution platform. I mean, my movie mm-hmm. – you know, I mean, the, here's the crazy thing, Rich. We're in Hollywood world right now, right? Mm-hmm. We're, in, we're in LA. We're two miles from Fox Studios. We're three, four miles from Universal. You know, all the big movie mm-hmm. houses, right? Now, I know people in media, so I was very fortunate – I got in to see the heads of all the studios. I gave screenings when the movie was finished in 2010 when I finally finished it. I, I did like two months out here of screenings to all the big studio executives trying to see whether they would buy the movie and distribute it through movie theatres. You know what I learned? They, they'd bring 200 people along, all their officers, all their people, to do the, the judgments. Every single time I did a screening, I was inundated with what's the recipe for the green juice? Where do mm. I buy a juicer? Like these were the questions. It wasn't about the movie. It was about what do I, what do I need to do? Where, is there a plan? I mean, this was the top executives. Mm-hmm. And I'm like thinking, this is really good. They're actually going to want to do the movie. They're going to want to <laughs> buy it. And then I'd say, well, here's that. You've got to get cucumber. You've got to get celery. You've got to get – and I'd talk for half an hour about the whole health side of things. And then at the end I'd say, and what about the movie? What do you think? Oh, no, 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 you're not Hugh Jackman or Russell Crowe. You know, we don't know how to market this. I tell you, it's a great movie though, but that recipe, thanks for that. See ya. Mm. And it was like, right. okay, so these guys in Hollywood don't understand that, you know, I mean, whether what that, sorry, let me rephrase that. They didn't understand how to market something that wasn't cookie cutter for how they normally do a film, which I understand. I mean, I get that. That's business. So- the power of the streaming, the power of Netflix and the, and, and the model that we have now, that if you can make content that's good enough, it will rise to the top and yeah, people will no share question. it. I mean, so, I, so I'm very fortunate to have that. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's doing incredibly well online on Netflix. And I think, you know, Forks Over Knives is still like one of the most downloaded documentaries or streamed documentaries on Netflix. I mean, there is a an interest and a movement and a, a zeitgeist moment that we're experiencing right now where people finally are really, you know, wanting to take a look at this and do something different. So absolutely. And and I and I believe the wave of like like <clears throat> it's easy for you and I, because we're living and breathing this all the time, to get a little bit um complacent, I think, to thinking that this movement is actually bigger than it is. Mm-hmm. Because it's actually really still small. When you really look at the 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 three hundred and sixteen million Americans and you take another sort of eight hundred million people living in the Western world and you add it all up to a billion people that are that are, you know, live in the way that we talked about earlier, in mm-hmm. the fun part of town. So it still is in it, it's in its infancy. And I am hugely uh optimistic about how big this tsunami, this 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 wave of awareness and and thirst and hunger to use the puns <laughs> for information for the rich content of food to put in their body i mean i i just you know i think there are you know a very very smart friend of mine who's a very bright boy he 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 told me he said joe there are four big stories in the world today in in the in the in terms of economics he said that's the rise of china the rise of the internet the American independence on energy story and the rise of health and wellness. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you have a, when I have a guy like that, who's a very smart guy, you know, tell me that those four things and he puts health and wellness in that category. And I know who he talks to. I know the smart people who control billions of dollars. When I hear that, you know, that's very um, optimistic to me that the, the top end of town is thinking that way. Right. So is this your full-time thing now? Are you still doing private equity? Or no, no, no. This is my full-time this thing. This is your full-time this thing. Is my, <laughs> this is my full-time <laughs> thing. I have to um, – I think that the opportunity – like I'm, I'm – you know, John Mackey um, wrote a book called Conscious Capital. I don't uh-huh. know whether, yeah. you, whether you read it or met yeah, yeah. But I, I really think that, that he, he's – the way he describes um, his business – is something that I would like to think that I can model my my company on, and in that I think that you, you can't just be too extreme. Of all you worry about is the customer, because then suppliers and your staff and investors are going to be left out, and you can't be all about making money, which is just for the investors, because then your customers are going to be not looked after. So it's about finding this 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 very. Um, this balance in, inside of your of the of the company side of things, as to doing good, but also valuing it and ensuring that that you can create some kind of a revenue stream that can keep the dream alive. And so that's what I've been working very hard on for the last few years. And you know, I give a lot of stuff away for free um, on the website and also in real life, like time when I go and talk at places and. And so on, and you know, I don't, know, I don't know how much I'll be able to keep that up because it's not really efficient to go to a town and speak to two hundred people when mm-hmm. you can be making television and making movies that can be reaching hundreds of thousands of people. But I still really like to, to press the flesh and to, to touch people and to hear them because I think I learn so much more when I do that. So the, the balance now is this is my full time job, um, and and you know, and I like to think of it that. You know, I'm, I'm very excited about it. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm loving it. I don't actually think about it, Rich, as a job. It's just what I do. It's just like my life. Mm-hmm. So I don't really think about days off or work days. It, mm-hmm. To me, everything is, you know, it's a Saturday now and we're doing this, right? Right. And, and I, I don't, this is not hard labor. I mean, I, people digging holes out, you know, and, and, and laying down, you know, tar on the roads, that's hard work. What, right. what I do is not hard work. What I do is um, I try my best to take complicated things that are difficult for some people to understand, try to make them simple for people to understand, try to put it in a logical way, try to do that in in storytelling, be it in movies or TV stuff that I'm trying to work on to try and work out ways that can make fun TV, um, stuff for the internet, whether it's short stuff like what you're doing here with podcasts and, and books and, 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 and events. And we just did a fantastic thing last month. We did a 200 people came and did Camp Reboot up in um, 
in uh, about two hours, three hours north of uh, of New York City, in a place called Rhinebeck at the mm-hmm. at the Optimum Health, uh, the uh, Omega Institute, and two hundred people came and juiced with me for six days, and it was awesome. Right. It was unbelievable from all over the country, mm-hmm. and just to see those people's changes in their lives just in those five six days, and just incredible. So, you know, that's. You know, so what I'm doing is I'm doing that. I mean, I look at my company as a media company. You know, I, I create content. We have an e-commerce platform for our our stuff on, on online, and we also do um, do licensing in terms of, of the brand mm-hmm. with uh, with corporations and 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 people who want to associate with our values. Mm-hmm. And I think that you know that's the model that I'm working on. Um, I'm enjoying it. It's uh, it's it's working so far. It's it's all you know. I've got fifteen, six, sixteen employees now. We just hired someone this week. Oh, that's great. So you know, sixteen mouths to feed, uh-huh. <laughs> or or juices to make. Yeah. So I mean, that's one good thing about wherever I go. I mean, wherever I go, I get free juice. So that's that. The, yeah. the expenses are pretty cheap on the juice. Let me ask you this: Did did Braville did they uh, did they pay for that branded entertainment in in uh, Fat Sick? Yeah, no, it's a good, you know, a de- uh, what, what kind of deal did you? It's make It's a really good question, that? and thanks for asking because it gives me a chance to to um, always talk about that. So so the interesting thing about this, and this is like people do not believe this. I, honestly, they, they, I tell this story and I think that people don't believe it. What, the, the, they doubled their revenue after the movie? I oh, know, well, that, I think people believe <laughs> No, I think people believe yeah. that. Yeah. No, 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 no. The story I'm going to tell you is, is that the night before we started shooting in New York, when I had no idea how to make a movie and I'd never done this before, we were doing a checklist of all the stuff we had and needed to make the movie. You know, we got all this stuff. We'd forgotten to buy the juices. Oh, no. this, 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 is a, this is how organized Team uh, Reboot and Joe Cross was the night before Countdown, all right, for, to starting this. Uh-huh. So I raced up to a store um, on, on, on Houston and uh, Broadway, at a crate and barrel store, mm-hmm. and I went in and I didn't know the first thing about machines. But the Breville brand I recognized from Australia. So I just went up and bought the juicer that I knew the brand. I mean, I'm like mm. one of those guys. I'm a brand guy. I go, okay, that must mm. be all right. I know that brand. I don't know I don't know these names, but I know that one. So I just bought the machine out of the, And then I was walking to the counter. I thought, oh, I better buy two because what if it breaks and I'm like in the middle of Omaha or Nebraska or mm-hmm. Kansas? I need a machine because, I mean, you know, this is not going to be pretty if mm-hmm. I haven't got a machine. So I went back and bought two. So I bought two of them. And um, that was it. Honestly, that was how I that was how I got that machine. It was no, I didn't talk to the company, I didn't do any endorsement, did nothing. And then about so that was like uh, October of '07, and then around uh, June, July of '08, when we were going out to um, to fill, mm-hmm. because I'd been in the edit room for a few months, I was posting on social media on my own. Uh, page, just my own page. I, I didn't have any company page or any pr- public profile page. I was posting photos from the edit room of me standing in front of the big screen with me behind the movie screen with juicing. Mm-hmm. You, you with me? Like, right. Because we ha- we, we'd hired this room to do the color correct. And so a friend of mine then shared that photo and someone from Breville saw that photo of me with a juicer. And so they then reached out via Facebook to me, what are you doing? We work at this company. And I said, oh, well, we're doing this movie, but we're not, not going to show you until it's finished, but mm-hmm. I'm not showing anybody until it's finished. And they said, well, if you need any help with machines, let us know and we'll, we'll just give you some because I was buying them at this stage. Right. So when we went out to do the fill sort of community reboot, you know how we went out there to Iowa after he was sort of in his, mm-hmm. in his, in his, in his mindset? We needed six machines, so we bought them. Actually, uh, Breville gave us those six machines for the for the filming when Phil was doing it. So that was mm-hmm. how they got involved via the social right. platform. And then um, it wasn't until until uh, the movie was finished, it was done, it was out. I didn't have any commercial relationship with them or any juice company at all. When the movie broke on Netflix in 2011, I had every juice extractor company in the world wanting to sign me. Right. to do a deal. And while some of the financial numbers were better from other companies, I just felt that I had to keep it real, that it would look kind of very strange is that I used a Breville juicer in the movie and now I'm using XYZ mm-hmm. juicer. Right. So I just felt that the whole 
idea to keep it real and keep it transparent. And I, I've got to be honest, Rich, if that juicer had broken like on day 15, I probably wouldn't have done the deal because <laughs> why am I going to endorse something that's going to break? broke in the middle. Yeah, and you'd probably want that in the movie too. Like, yeah, oh, but it broke. That would create a crisis moment it, in the movie. It would have been, but <laughs> what I'm saying is I, I wouldn't endorse something that had yeah, broke after 15 gotcha. days. Uh-huh. So the fact that I didn't need the second machine, the fact that it it lasted, and the fact that I just felt that to be true to the fans and the and the people who wanted to really do this is they're going to spend their hard earned money. I mean, money is really hard to come by. That they may as I may as well make stay true to the values. Mm-hmm. So while it wasn't the the most lucrative deal at the time, like to to actually sign up, there was much bigger money being offered by infomercial world and all that. Right. I just felt you know what, just keep it real. You know what's amazing is you're you're kind of recounting these dates like oh in you know early 2007 this was going on and I'm thinking what was I doing at that time and you know we're essentially the same age and we kind of started this thing at the same time like you did your 60 days like literally like at the same time that I was starting to do this and then kind of getting back into being fit and you're making a documentary and I'm training for Ultraman you know yeah. like yeah. and here we are like sitting here talking about it a couple of years later it's 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 crazy I, you man. know I, 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 my moment happened when I turned 40 right that's exact mine m- mine happened literally like the day or two days before my 40th birthday mine was a day of because so. I went out the night before and I mm-hmm. went crazy the night before so the next morning I mean you know I was in real bad shape I'd had that's a good place to start, though. Well, it you was, know? but you know, it was, it was something about it was something about having a four, at, in, like, like you know, it was something about having a four at the front of my birth, my age, mm-hmm. like a three. I could handle it. Was close to a two. Forty's a big, yeah. I mean, four's close to five. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, it's like, it's, hey, getting up there. It's so trite, you know. It's that oh, turn forty, you know, what's what, you know, what is my life about? Kind of moment, but yeah. you know, it happens. It's true. It happened to both of us. And I think another thing that I wanted to kind of talk about a little bit. I know we're going long. I don't want to take you too long, but but there's the other kind of thing that resonates with your story that that I relate to a lot is this idea of kind of, um, you know, being a successful guy, you know, you kind of did everything that you thought, uh, would make you happy. You know, you're pursuing wealth, you're, you're successful, you're making money, you're kind of adhering to all of society's rules about like what you're supposed to do as a man to be successful, to be respected, to feel good about yourself. We both did that. I was a lawyer and, uh, and I played that out and it literally led me to like a spiritual crisis of, you know, I did all the things that I thought I was supposed to do. And not only am I terribly unhealthy, I'm really like unhappy with mm-hmm. these choices that I've made and where I'm at with my life. And then for you to be sitting here and say, you know, oh, it's Saturday. Like, I don't consider what, I, what I'm doing work now. You know, it's just what I do. You know, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. And that's a long way from, you know, kind of, Long doing way. something that is, you know, the more traditional route. Yeah. No, no. I mean, I know, I'm sure you do too. I know a lot of people with a lot of money and I, you know, most of them aren't as happy as people who've got less, to be honest. I mean, Hey, we're in Hollywood right now. You yeah. know how many like really rich people I know that are, you know, really not happy people? Yeah, like, a, a lot. lot. You know, There's a lot. lot. Um, I think, I think also, uh, you know, sticking with the theme of, of keeping it simple, because I've given this a lot of thought, this this subject that you've talked about. And, you know, I think that when it comes down to it, we are jugglers. That's what we are. Each and every one of us is a juggler. And we're predominantly juggling five things. We juggle family and friends. We juggle love. We juggle our career. We juggle our health. And we juggle self. So... And for self, that could be your a lot of things, but it's really your, your yourself. So how you view yourself, your whether it's your religion, your spirituality, just self. And so if you think about juggling those five things, um, what I was doing is that I was completely dropping one or two of the balls, I, and I dropped them for a long time. So I found it easier to juggle three things than five things, Rich. Right. So the three things being. Well, I, I was juggling family and friends. I was juggling career, and um, I was juggling uh, uh, self. I think mm-hmm. I, you know, still doing that. The 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 things that I wasn't uh, doing was health and love. Okay, I was like, they were the ones. They were the balls I dropped. Mm-hmm. Okay, I, I just like 
I'm not going to worry about those. I'm going to let them wither on the vine over there, okay? <laughs> so, you know, and, and if you do that, I think what happens is is that you, you end up with a crisis because you can't ignore those other balls that you have to juggle in, to be a human, to, to, to achieve happiness, to achieve um, success in the terms of – see, to me, success is keeping all five balls in the air. Mm-hmm. That, that's what success is to me, keeping them up there and, and, and doing your best you can and balancing that, that effort to, in all five of them and not just focusing on one. It's easy to focus on one. And I was, you know, the career one, I mean, I was gun ho at that. Mm-hmm. I was good at that. And so I give myself the pat on the back for being good at the career and that's what I was focused on. Well, and, and culturally, that's really what's prioritized. You sure, know, for sure. Men. It's and like, so hey, it if you're appears, doing good in your career, then you're doing good. And it appears on the outside – that you are successful, mm-hmm. that you are. So it's it's an illusion, okay? It's a complete illusion. It's, it's nothing more than an illusion. And we can't cheat ourselves as to our own happiness. I mean, I, I really do believe that, that, that the happier I am, I find the more useful I am, the happier I am is probably the thing I've learned the most out of this whole journey. The more useful, more happy. When I feel useless is when I'm least happy. And so... I think that that juggling of those five balls now, I really, you know, and I'm, I'm not, by the way, I'm far from perfect, okay? But I'm trying <laughs> is what I'm trying to do. And having the awareness of trying to do it and, and you know, working on it and, and just putting the effort in, which actually means you're keeping busy trying to do it and being useful actually propels the momentum of happiness forward. Mm-hmm. So- that's the way I look at it now. I mean, you know, if, if someone had told me that I'd be getting up in front of 2,000 people talking about bowel movements six years ago, I would have said they've got rocks in right. their head. <laughs> yeah. But now it's like one of my favourite subjects, you know, uh-huh. what goes in must come out. And so just having this, this, this uh, I mean, I, I mean look, I'm blessed. I'm very, very lucky to be 47 years of age um, and to have this view that for the next 20 years I feel like I'm going to be making content and, and sharing stories and, 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 and meeting people like yourself that are doing incredible things out there in the world. Um, and, and the great thing about what we do, I'm now putting my business hat on, is that you and I have no competitors. That, that, that's the incredible thing about this. It's very unusual in, in, in the business side of things. Every single person out there that is trying to share or spread the word, I am only too happy to promote. Mm-hmm. And you are too. Yeah, absolutely. Which is unusual when you think about it. But because it's in the infancy of this, of this, um, this tsunami of, of uh, awareness that's coming, that we're all just trying to help each other get as much of the word out as possible because it's going to, in the end, there is so much uh, to be done. That, we, that no one person can do it all. Oh, there's no way. It has to be done together as and a team. I, and I think that the the happiness quotient um, really is a function of of just doing something that's of service, really. I mean, you're of service and, you know, no doubt you get crazy emails from people all over the world or phone calls or people that you have conversations with who tell you how you've touched their lives. Sure. And, and you know that you're on the right path and that this is what you're supposed to be doing and it keeps you directed and motivated. Look, I mean, I'm blessed. I, there's not a day that goes by that I can't go on Twitter or Facebook and with every, I mean, there's probably not even, to be really honest, there's probably not a two-hour period that doesn't go by where I don't get a note from somebody thanking me. Now, just think about that. Every two hours, someone I don't even know in the world from somewhere like in Iceland or from Dubai or from Argentina or from Omaha, Nebraska mm-hmm. or from Philadelphia sending me a note saying you've touched my I mean that's that that is that that that's worth you know more than any yeah. houses or planes or you boats. Can't, you can't go back to private equity no. when, when you well, you're done. Well, well, I mean you could but you you know I'm not going back there you but take I, that skill set that you have I and take you, it forward. you uh, yeah you I, I, I direct take, it in a exactly, appropriate direction Exactly I think I think that that um, we have to live in the world today bound by the rules we have okay there are rules there are taxes to pay, there's rent to pay, mm-hmm. there's mouths to feed, okay? So we can't be completely off in the 
pixies and believing in fairies at the bottom of the garden. We have to keep it real. We have to make sure that we're diligent about the way that we spend our money, our time, our effort, and the business that we're building. Because if you if you can't pay the bills, you can't send the message out, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it, there is a balance. So I I, I, I try to keep it um, in check, and I'm I'm fortunate that I've got the business skills that I did in the past life, you know, yeah. that I can bring forward now and use those in this this current trajectory of spreading as much of the of of my story and other people's stories as possible because I think it's story driven is uh is 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 what I is the area that I'm focused on in trying to um to promote this uh this uh world of of feeling better, looking better, living longer and and being happier. I mean and really it's when you think about it Richard's pretty crazy that you know, we've got a like. If you went back like two thousand years, and you said like, "What do you do?" Oh, like we're in the we're in the business of promoting people to eat more fruits and vegetables. <laughs> They'd like look at you and go, "So that's all there is to eat, isn't yeah. there? What else is there? Is there anything else I'm supposed to be doing?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're creating a business out of this. How does that work exactly? I, I, I don't get that. Uh huh. Well, so I we think are. it's. I think it's. Um, it's. One of the one of the one of the things that I'm I'm constantly reminded of also is is that is that there's a multi billion dollar business behind what we do. I mean the, the the farmers, agriculture, the fruit and vegetable people, they're all out there. I mean they want they they're, they're happy for what you and I are doing. They're mm-hmm. very excited about this. So harnessing that power and right now it's like herding cats. All these people out there in the in the space of uh, of, of the fruit and vegetable. But I mm-hmm. I'm, I'm confident. That, that that they will unite and that they'll be able to get that message out in a more powerful way that can can be uh, as strong as some of these other corporations that are you know pushing water and sugar and salt mm-hmm. and fat. So I, I'm optimistic about the future. I'm glad to hear that. I mean, that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you: is if you you know if that if that optimism ever gets tempered, you know, in, in some of just watching the conversations that you have with these people in the in the in the documentary, and they're just you know, you just sit there and you tell them, here's your path to becoming a completely different, improved person. And they're, they just say, thank you, but no, thank you. You know, and it's like easy to get worn out. Like you said, you had 300, you met 350 people. Yeah. How many, I I met a lot more I spoke to. Yeah. And so how many of those people are just sort of like dismissive? Does that ever wear you down? No, it never wears me down. I don't, I don't get worn down with it. I think, I I think that, that uh, what I, the way I look at it is, is that, the people who are like 50 and 60 years of age now, if they're going to continue down the path that, that we're talking about, like this, this you know, 93% of their energy coming from that source, they're not going to be with us long. Like they're not going to be around. It's just, just the way it works. I mean, that's just biological laws of cause and effect. They won't be here. But who is here is their children. And what I'm noticing is how many of the younger generation – it's like, you know, we have this, we, we, you and I have probably, we've been around for two generations, I guess. We were born one and now mm. we're sort of becoming the next one. And whatever, what history teaches us is that every generation rebels against their, mm-hmm. the one before in some way, you know. And I really think that the one, this generation now is rebelling in terms of, I don't want to be like mum and dad. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be on five medications. I don't want to be obese and sick and tired and unhappy and miserable. I don't want to be that. And so I think that the, the that this new generation of youth that's coming through, through the power of their – I mean, look, there's a lot – they're not perfect. There's a mm. lot of things about them which scares the hell out of me, all right? Mm-hmm. Um, you talked about it earlier in this, this, you know, not wanting to do stuff too tough and hard right. and that. But if there's anything I can see from a positive side is I see so many young people in their teens – and in their early twenties, that are really interested in this, you know, and momentum is really picking up for young people who want to make this a career, whether it's health coaching or going into it, um, into the world of, of wellness and preventative medicine. And so, I see younger doctors really in tune with this, very much more holistic about nutrition than older doctors. So. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very optimistic. I mean, do you, do you ever watch a show called Mad Men? Of course. You know the show? Yeah. 
So I, I like to think about Mad Men once again, using <laughs> using perspective. You know, I mean, you go back to Mad Men in the in, what is it, a nineteen sixties sort of era is when they're on Madison Avenue and you've got mm-hmm. the executives and you know what are the what are the three things on Mad Men that really shock us today when we watch it and that's the them smoking, drinking the, the drinking the, the drinking the smoking and and Misogyny. patting <laughs> patting the sec, patting the secretaries yeah. and you know this this attitude towards women mm-hmm. you know like i mean Peggy's the the young sort of executive and it's you know all the secretaries are women and they're all mm-hmm. having an affair you know what i mean it's like this attitude now if you think like today, they're the three things that shock us the most. And it's like, yeah, you can't, can't imagine that world today on right. Madison Avenue. And it just doesn't happen. So I kind of think that, well, what are people going to look back in, say, 50 years' time on this time right now? What are people going to look at going, geez, what, what are they doing back there in 2010 and 2015? In Can you imagine doing that now in 2055, 2060? Right, you like know the what super I, big gulp and the – you know, I think hopefully. it's going to be the fact that that can you believe they let advertising be played on television to their kids on Saturday mornings of those sorts of products were able to be positioned to children. Can you imagine that parents actually went out and bought this food and gave it to their kids? Can you imagine that? That mm-hmm. that's that's where I think it's going to be in fifty years' time. I hope so. You know, I would love nothing more than for that to be the case and including changing school lunches. And it really is all about the kids. And it does start with the marketing messages that are sent over the airwaves to the children. You know, they're so powerful. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I bring, I come back to supply and demand, okay? Because everything, when you, when you talk about economics, and at the end of the day, the economic shift in what we're talking about is going to come to bear. You cannot have a society, like I think it's right now, there's, I mean, I, I want to get these numbers right, so I'm going to go into my memory. I think it's 26 million Americans right now are diabetic, okay? So either 23 or 26, but I'm going to, I'm going to go with 26 million are diabetic. And about right. over 100 million are pre-diabetic. Think about that. A third of the country is pre-diabetic. Now, if we continue to go at the rate we're going, we're going to have – those people will become diabetics. They'll, they'll, they'll get there. You can't have the economics do not support a society where that many people are on medication, that many people are sick. It just doesn't, it won't work. It'll collapse upon itself. So I'm- But in our country, we'll allow it to collapse unless regulation comes in to <clears throat> curb that. So it really isn't so much a supply and demand thing because unchecked, you know, the fast food companies are reliant on getting kids hooked on this stuff and develop, developing them into lifelong customers, irrespective of the long-term, you know, health ramifications of eating that way. In the same way that the cigarette companies, you know, noticed that, you know, before laws came in to regulate their advertising, it was all about trying to get young people interested in smoking. Sure. Okay. So maybe in terms of that, what I was, I actually started talking about supply and demand and I went off on another track. So- just take that diabetes situation, right? That's the reality. Mm-hmm. Now go to supply and demand in the way that I wanted to talk about it was, is that I believe that you and I are in the demand side of the equation. This is what we are. We are out sharing stories and inspiring and educating and entertaining people to increase demand, okay? If we can increase demand, the supply will come. Mm-hmm. There, right now when you go into a supermarket and you pull out $5, and you buy a packet of Oreo cookies, which I love, by the way, you buy a packet of Oreos, you are sending a message up the food chain through to, I think it's um, Nestle that makes that product, Mm -hmm. and to make more. So you are voting with your hard-earned money in the demand, please make more. The same thing happens if you buy kale or buy cucumber or buy broccoli. You are sending a message to the farmers, please grow more. So what I am very passionate about is getting that message out to people that when you spend your hard-earned dollar, you are voting for something on the supply side. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, the simple mathematics and equation is, is that if 50 million Americans walked into McDonald's tomorrow and said, I want a green juice, they did it the next day, they did it the next day, what do you think McDonald's would be selling (laughs) next week? They would be selling green juice. Mm -hmm. So this is where the economics of supply and demand for me 
uh, that what we need to do is we need to level the playing field. We need to make it easier, more affordable. We need to make it time effective for people to get energy into their body that is more nutrient dense, more nutrient rich than what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But I believe that the demand is coming. And so because of that, the supply will, will, will prevail. I agree with you that there's the headwinds against us are strong and the, the, the wind is on our nose right now. I mean, we're bashing through it right now. Mm-hmm. But I'm confident that changes will occur. When I, talk, when I hear people, big end of town people talk about this, when I see the investment that's going in right now in the valley into these sorts of startup companies that are about supplying healthier options and foods, mm-hmm. and I see that happening, it's early days. I mean, what are we, 2013? What we're talking about may not take effect to 2020, 2022, as an example, just to go out eight, nine, ten years. But it's coming. And so I believe that. I believe that that the people in Congress will realise, the people that will see it, that what they're doing is they're actually subsidising corporations to make this food that is – so low in nutrients, it's so high in energy, but so low in nutrients that it's causing this effect for a two point eight trillion dollar medical expense bill. I, I see. Yeah, it. it's an incredibly expensive, inefficient system that is essentially just making us sick and driving up healthcare costs. So, from a if you're an economist, just <laughs> looking at that, you're like, this needs disruption. Yeah, this needs to be changed. We cannot continue down this path and be a sustainable economy. Yeah, and I believe it's coming. I'm, I'm very optimistic about it. Timeline, I wish it was tomorrow, but yeah. that won't happen. Yeah. Well, we're taking steps now. We're doing our best. Yeah. We're doing it. And remember, <laughs> the, world, the world wasn't changed by reasonable people. No, which, it was not. Okay? You have to be unreasonable right. to make the change. Let's, let's shake on being unreasonable. Okay, right we're now. unreasonable All together. Right. <laughs> Good on you, Rich. All right, man. Well, I, I think we should uh, end it on that, man. Yeah. How do you but feel? We Anything want, else we you want, want to talk about? We want lots of people to be unreasonable. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, mate, I think it's good. I appreciate it. Thanks for the yeah, time. Thanks and it's for, been great chatting. Uh, thanks for doing it, man. So if you want to uh, connect with Joe or learn more about uh, what Joe is up to, go to rebootwithjoe.com, right? Yep, is that the best right. place? Yep. And yep. Um, I'm on Twitter at, uh, at Joe the Juicer. Mm-hmm. And also on uh, Facebook, uh, we've got a Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead page, and we've got a Joe Cross public profile page. Right, and there's fat, sick, and nearly dead. dot com is up just as just some information about the movie, right? Yeah, and, and in the movie for those who haven't seen it, you can watch it on Netflix, you can watch it on Hulu, um, you can go to iTunes, Amazon. It's on all those platforms. Um, right. And uh, you know, one of the one of the really uh, fun things that we've been able to do is because um, of our partnership with Breville, is that we've got some marketing dollars, which you know, companies our size wouldn't even dream of, and so. We've been making some TV ads that are going to go out in uh, in a couple of weeks across mm-hmm. America. So we're going to have these ads on TV that are going to show the uh, the success stories of some people oh, and cool. try and drive people to watch it online. So mm-hmm. That's going to be fun. That's great. So um, yeah, no, it's it's, uh, it's all it's all it's all pretty cool. And um, you know the the thing that that I'm I'm blown away by with is that if this didn't work, the fact that we're so open on social media, we get enough people telling us it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. But I'm just blown away by I don't get that. I mean, I get people saying it was too hard and I had to stop, but I just don't ever get people saying it didn't work. Mm-hmm. And that is that that that's like really kind of crazy when right. you think about it. You know, you'd expect some people to say, "Oh, you know, I did the ten days, didn't work," but right. you don't. You don't get that. You get everybody saying it was tough, it was hard, but boy, I feel amazing mm-hmm. and thanks so much. And that was great. So. You know, and and by the way, I didn't invent it. You didn't invent it. This is something that's been around for a no. That's the, the thing. Time. It's not a. It's not really a product. You're just no. saying, drink drink a bunch of vegetables yeah. for ten days and see how you feel. Yeah, there's yeah. No, there's nothing proprietary about that. No, you know? roll the dice. I know, so <laughs> anyway, man. All right. Well, you're okay. you're an inspiration. Oh, you are too. Rich. I appreciate uh, I appreciate the time, and I look forward to seeing the new movie when it comes out, and all the TV shows and the media empire that you're building here. Just doing my best, mate. Just doing my best. I know you are too, and it's it's great to connect with other people that are that are on the path. So it's it's a it's awesome, and I'm sure we'll see each other again. I'll get you on one of my shows. Absolutely, man. All right, mate. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot. Peace, Lance.